OnStar is a built-in connection available in most GM vehicles. This is OnStar. How may I help you? I was drinking at a bar, something I had started to do in earnest after a few months on the job. A man sat next to me and we began chatting about this and that, but nothing important. When we came to the topic of work, and I told him I answered calls for OnStar and he seemed disproportionately interested in the topic. He wanted to know the gruesome accidents I had dealt with. And I told him, no, that wasn't really my department. We had special guys that dealt with the heavy stuff, and I wasn't qualified to deal with anything more than a fender bender. You don't have to train for that kind of thing? He asks incredulously, as if I had just said I was a doctor that hadn't gone to med school. And I told him, sure. I was trained in the very basics of the emergency dispatch stuff, but just enough to deal with that first minute of the call before I could shunt them off on someone else. It wasn't really even a problem, I explained to him, because there were two buttons on any OnStar console, one for emergencies and one for routine matters, and people didn't really mix them up. Only the alcoholics got them confused, and even then, the alcoholics were either calling before an accident, which was harrowing in its own special way, or we were calling them after an accident. He told me we'd have to fix that, and I asked how he intended for us to fix that tonight at this bar, and he said we'd do a bit of training. By this point, I was on my fourth or so $8 beer and he'd gone through near as many Cuba Libres, so I took this as a meaningless drunk posturing and changed the subject. We carried on for a while longer, but he wore out before me and said he was about to head home. He asked me for my cell number before he went, saying it had been fun and we'd have to meet up again sometime. I still had a little bit in me, and I didn't have to work the next day so I stayed for a while after that. But sometimes, if I hung around until it was nearly closing, I might get lucky and meet a nice enough girl to take home. He'd been fun to hang around with, but as long as he was there, there weren't any girls that were going to have the slightest bit of interest in me. I'd been alone at post for about an hour when I got a call. Unknown number. I picked it up. Hello, who is this? Oh, hey, you remember me? We were hanging out in the bar. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. I slumped down in my seat. I'd had my eyes on a pair of increasingly tipsy girls, and one of them had started to notice me. But that would have to be put on hold. What's up? Well, time for a practice session. His voice was still a little slurred. I tried to remember how he had left the bar, but came up blank. I hadn't been paying attention, and I assumed the bartender had, however, and I didn't remember anyone taking his keys or him asking for his keys back or anything. Come on, get in the game. What you gotta say to me first? I sighed and shifted my phone. Thank you for calling OnStar, this is Joe. How can I assist you today? Joe, thank God. I was in an accident. I need your help. I'm panicking over here. Okay, you called the right place. Take deep breaths. I'm going to walk you through this. Are you injured? Are you still in your car? Uh, yes, I'm a little shook, but... Oh, look. I got a little bitty blood on my old forehead. I think my steering wheel must have hit my head, but I'm okay. I reckon... I got a ding on the front of my car, but it's still running fine. It's still running fine. Are you still driving your car? Oh yeah, man, I can't stop. I don't want anyone to catch me around here. Okay, Jesus, what do you mean by that? Oh, hey, 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 this is a no-judgment zone, right, Joe? You're here to help me. 
I'm telling you I need help. That's Planet Fitness. Come on, tell me, you're really okay, alright? You didn't actually get into an accident, did you? Oh, hey, Joe. Joe, Joe, calm the fuck down. I just hit a guy, okay? But we need to get you trained. We gotta get you that promo. Jesus, you hit a guy? I mean, you're, you're shitting me, right? Ah, oh, Joe, don't worry about it. I'm throwing a Franklin at the bartender and stepping outside. There's an alley nearby and I squeeze myself in there to put him on speaker while I try to find someone, anyone, who's awake to text to call the cops while I keep him busy on the line. Uh, tell me what I need to do, Joe. I'm scared and my car is making a really funny noise. Can you pull off the road for a moment? We need to try to diagnose what's wrong with your car. I don't have my computer, so you're going to have to talk me through it, alright? Ah, fuck man, you ever listen? I'm not stopping for nothing. But I'll tell you what, Joe. My car is actually smoking. Uh, out of the engine or something? I don't know. Maybe I got a bigger bump than I thought. It looks kind of crinkly. Alright, remind me what you drive again. Uh, Passat. I think it's a lemon, Joe. There's always something wrong with this damn car. Y you want to hear a real horror story? Well, ask me what the dealer put me through when I was looking at buying this car. Dude locked me in his office for two hours. I literally locked me in. Now, I was about to piss in his coffee mug, I'll tell you that. What am I supposed to do here, Joe? I mean, should I go back and make sure the guy is really dead? I, you know... China, they, they got this thing. What you should do is pull over. A smoking engine is never a good sign. I find a friend that was awake. Praise be to those frat boy types that like to stay out until 1 on a Thursday night. I tell him to call 911 to look for a Passat somewhere around downtown. I tell you, you keep telling me to pull over. My bright right in your fucking eyes is going to be the last thing you see. I consider this. I text my friend and I text my mom. Pull over or come over here, whichever. But we gotta figure out what's wrong with your engine man, or else it could explode. And what good would that do for anyone? He makes an indecipherable sound, and I listen to his heavy breathing. I scan the street, and in a few minutes, things do get awfully bright. She arrived for the meeting right on time. She was dressed very pleasantly in a gray suit. One that Tony noticed nearly matched his own gray suit. She glanced around his office, seeming pleased by the simple and cheery atmosphere that Tony had worked hard to ensure was just so, and their initial pleasantries were very light, very personable. He had a good first impression of her, and believed she felt the same of him, and certainly, there was no mistaking the way she leaned forward and set her bright blue eyes upon him with such shine. Thank you so much again for agreeing to meet with me like this, she was saying. I know that it's unusual for you to meet with customers face to face, but as I've said, this is a delicate matter. One that I'd rather not talk about over the phone. I understand. Tony said. Not that he did, um, not really. But she had just shown up at the front desk and asked to speak with a representative in person. He'd sent Rogers to take care of the call center and stationed himself to receive their guest. She twirled the string of hair around her finger. Well, yes, you see, I had a question about information, specifically about data. What kind of data do you keep 
what you throw away. I understand that you may not be able to give me these precise details because of, well, corporate confidentiality. And here, she curled her fingers, and Tony thought for a moment how very unpleasant she seemed at that moment. But if you could just give me a general overview... Tony cleared his throat and reached into a file drawer. I believe the standard OnStar contract that is given to you when you sign up for our service would provide a great deal of the information you are looking for. She smiled at him, her eyes sweet voids. Oh, how silly of me to forget. Could I trouble you for a summary regardless? You know, as long as we're both here. Oh, certainly. I can give you an idea of the information we keep in use, as well as how we use it. All of this you could find in our privacy statement, available online or in your own contract, if you happen to know where it is. We collect the standard array of personal information, name, address, information about your vehicle, credit card information, and so on. We collect information about the use of your vehicle, location, speed, camera images, as well as any data that is registered from various sensors, including crash, impact, or swerves, you know, things like that. And tell me, she interrupted him, her eyes bright, do you simply use this information within your company? It doesn't leave this building, so to speak. Tony fingers found their way to his cufflink. He thought he heard a small scurrying sound somewhere. He would have to call someone about it later. A big portion of the data we collect does stay in-house, yes. However, we do share some information. For instance, we are often the first responders when a car is registered as having been in an accident, or when a car is reported as stolen. We are the ones to inform the police and other emergency personnel. But such sharing would be limited to an emergency? Well, typically, yes. I mean, if for some reason law enforcement was to present us with a warrant for information, we would provide it to them, but I'm sure that would not be a concern. She shook her head demurely. Tony was heartened. Therefore, generally speaking, we use your data primarily to assist you when you call us, to improve your experience of our product, for some unobtrusive marketing means and in very rare cases, it can be used when the safety of yourself or others is jeopardized. She nodded along to his explanations. Her eyes wandered around the room, only occasionally looking up to him. His years of service detected the waiting question on her tongue, and he kept this silence while she thought, May I be frank with you, Tony? She looked so sweet and innocent in the charcoal suit that nearly matched his own. He answered before she had finished. Yes, Mrs. Thompson, please. This has all started because I was recently gifted a car. I won't get too personal. Let's just say it was sort of a gift from my ex-husband. I do have a car of my own, an old beater, but I have no problem keeping it. It was my intentions to give the car to my son. He's grown now, mind you, has children of his own, but I thought since I don't really need the thing, he can have it. But I found out it has this OnStar thing, and, well, my son is a good boy, but he could be a little hot-headed, drives a little fast, if you know what I mean. Um, certainly, Tony said with a shudder. He had a 17-year-old himself, and no amount of promises seemed to stop the boy from tearing out of their driveway like the hounds of hell were on his tail. And yet, it was just so lovely to have another point in common with this woman. And, you see, the boy has gotten himself in trouble before. 
I don't need some big brother with their eyes on his odometer, ready to pounce on him the second the needle hits 80. Can you understand? Of course, Mrs. Thompson. I understand perfectly, and I can assure you with total confidence that is not how things work here on OnStar. Even if a car were to be monitored real-time, there must be a reason for us to watch the car. An accident registers, we receive a call, something like that. Even if we wanted to, we could not keep our eyes on every car and client under our car. That's, what, several million vehicles? And our staff number is not more than 5,000. We work hard to serve you in your times of need. Tony concluded, his voice strong. And that is the heart of what we do here at OnStar. Tony thought he had put it nicely, quite nicely, and Mrs. Thompson smiled. No, Tony realized, with a frown, it was not a smile. She was smirking at him. Perhaps he had laid it on a little too thick. She stood and he followed suit, jerkily, somehow feeling immensely unhappy. She extended a hand to him. That's about all I needed to know, Tony, she purred. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, well, I'm glad I could answer your questions. Your safety is our priority. We're available whenever you need us. It's not my safety I'm worried about. She called behind her as she sashayed away. Do you ever get tired that you start to feel like you're stuck between waking and dreaming? It happens to me. Not often, but it does happen. I'm not the type to remember my dreams, but these strange, vague states remain in my mind. Hazy, but still present. To tell the truth, I'm not sure if I'm actually awake or actually sleeping during these times. There's never anyone around to bear witness, and the evidence I leave behind could go either way. Well, a few nights ago, I was working the witching hours. I seem to remember being alone on the floor, which, if I was awake, I wouldn't be. There was always someone else, but when you're facing the wall or the window, if people are up from their desks and the phones are mostly quiet, it is possible to feel alone, at least. So far, so good. And I was working alone, or not, and I received a call. And I can remember it came in as a blue button call, a non-emergency. And I cannot remember the name of who called me or the vehicle. And I don't always remember. However, a good rule of thumb is that if I remember the call itself, I usually remember who called me. And in this case, maybe the call itself overshadowed the mundane details of who was doing the calling. So far, so good. I remember a woman's voice. I remember she sounded sort of scared. If she had sounded more scared, I would have called the police but she was just scared enough for me to take care, to be extra considerate in my call with her. She needed directions. Nothing unusual in that, or perhaps it was a little unusual because she sounded young, and the younger ones had smartphones and good vision, so that they could rely on their phones to get them around. GPS calls came more from the older crowd, but not exclusively. So far so good. She was traveling down a country road, actually a state highway, but I know from experience you can call just about any road that goes from point A to B, state highway, as long as it's not national highway or it doesn't dead end in a cul-de-sac. She was trying to get to one of those little dead end cul-de-sacs though. Something about she was trying to get to her step-parents house and I think she went on a somewhat long-winded, nervous explanation that both her parents had some terrible luck. They'd divorce each other, 
found new partners, remarried. Then at some family event, the stepmother and stepfather had discovered they liked each other rather more than the parents. So her parents had gotten a second divorce each, and the stepparents then remained with each other. But people talk to me. They say I have a kind demeanor. And all that she had to do was drive straight on this country road for some 10 miles before we had to start turning into residential streets. So, so far, so good. And I was sitting there, listening to her chatter, taking sips of coffee. I felt woozy. I had been awake a while longer than I should have been. And I almost missed the first time she asked me if something had happened to her car. And I almost missed it, and I had no idea what she meant. She said her car was slowing down, or she said that her brakes weren't working. And I tried to clear my foggy head, heavy with the chatter she had filled with it. Her distress was growing, and it crowded out her words. I had no idea of what she was saying. I did the simple thing, told her to pull off to the side of the road. I told her to take some deep breaths and cut the engine, but not to turn the car off completely. It would be a good idea to turn her headlights off, but only if she felt safe enough to do that. I told her to take a few minutes to calm down. She didn't speak, and I kept up a soothing procession of conversation. She was almost there. The road conditions were clear. I was right there with her, and I could call a tow truck, cop, her step-parents, or anyone she needed me to call. She went through a taste of her own personal hell, but then she pulled herself together. All was okay again. So far, so good. She started the car without a problem and put it in park. She asked me again if something had happened to her car. And just a second later, and the panic was back in her voice, she said that the car was driving by itself now. To my shame, and this is why I wonder if I was dreaming, because I'm a kind person, these are not my thoughts. The first thing that came to my mind was to ask her if that was better or worse than the car not responding to anyone. I might have even said it to her. I might not have. But she insisted the car was driving by itself. And I likely did ask her if the driving was erratic. She likely responded that it wasn't driving dangerously. But there was something stiff and off in the way it moved. Like the way an RC car moved. The two of us rode along with her car, her inside, and me tracking at the computer. It continued down the route to her step-parent's house, and I wondered if she wasn't as tired as I was. I offered to call someone, anyone for her. She now said the police scared her, more than the idea that some stranger was someone controlling her car from who knew where, apparently. And I asked her if I could call her step-parents for her. I could put them directly on this call with us. And that set her off on a story about how her step-parents didn't actually know she was coming. She was just trying to get away from her father. And talking about it seemed to calm her down, so I let her off on her own tangent. Her story went on for so long, and the car continued to go slowly down the road without incident. And I don't know what happened. At some point, she was silent, and at some point, that silence continued on. And at some point after that, I realized the call had ended, and my headset was already ringing again. Startled, I picked up, thinking it was her calling back again. It was not. It was some yuppie on the highway asking where the nearest gas station was. I took the minute to help her and dug through my records. 
but the girl was gone. Human memory may be fallible, but computers and technology was not. Exhaustion may tamper with my memory, but the computer had protocols to follow. If there was no open record of the call, nothing to show that I had tracked and watched this lone car down a lonely road, then what happened? Was I dreaming? 